The Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission on uh, Wednesday kicked off a three-day consultation forum to fine-tune regulatory issues for the successful implementation of the Petroleum Industry Act. For members of oil and gas producing communities, they say it's time for the government to take their concerns seriously. Arise business correspondent Uni Sunday was at the event and sent in this report. After a tumultuous journey to passage, the Petroleum Industry Act isn't done with its journey. Its implementation will be the true test of a bill which ended its 20-year journey in 2021. The bid to get it right is why stakeholders in Nigeria's upstream oil and gas industry, the Ministry of Petroleum and host communities are gathered in this room. This first phase of the stakeholders' engagement will capture robust discussions. We capture robust discussions around issues dealing with royalty, licensing rents, fees and renters, body issues on the implementation of host community fund in line with section 235 of the PIA. The regulations to be discussed include the Nigerian upstream fee and rent regulations, domestic gas delivery obligations, Nigeria conversion regulations, Nigeria royalty, and host communities regulations. We will all agree that effective regulations are key to harnessing the gains of the BIA and government has a mandate of ensuring sound management of the oil and gas sector, considering the key role the sector plays in the revenue generation profile of the country. Over the years, the most contentious areas in negotiations were those concerning host communities. Clarifying the grey areas is of utmost importance to most present here. Paragraph 4 of the draft host communities regulations, which deals with the limiting of the determination of area of operation to only surface area of leases and licenses, may be fraught with unlimited range of complications. Therefore, to avoid possible incalculable mischief that may cause unmanageable conflicts and insecurity, area of operation should simply be based on the area covered by the lease or license, covering both surface and non-surface areas within the map of the lease or license. The limited area of operation to surface areas appears to serve no useful purpose. Senator Deggy also noted the inability of stakeholders, mostly in impoverished host communities, to attend virtual meetings to save cost, as stipulated. For the National Technical Committee Chairman for Oil and Gas Producing Host Communities, priority should be given to issues affecting host communities. The entire exercise is all about host communities. And if the gray areas like the Senate chairman on House Committee for host communities has stressed, if it is not well addressed, we are talking of oil theft, we are talking of um, artisanal refineries, it's going, to, it's going to affect the country's petroleum productivity. Other members agree. The organized community groups like HOSCOM should be part and parcel of the decision-making body at the highest echelon. They should look for those veteran you know, experts, like some of us, and get involved so that those who will not go there to loot. A lot of bill has been signed into acts. We have the one that established NDDC. We have the one that established the 13% derivation that this act should take care of the host communities where or here are being produced. But at the end of the day, looking at the duration when some of this bill has been signed into act up to now, there is nothing, little or nothing to show. At the end of the two-day summit, it is expected that the stakeholders will formulate a draft which will balance Nigeria's interests alongside those of the global markets.
All right, joining us to discuss further is uh, Tolu Awinfa, who's an energy specialist, joining us uh, live from London. Tolu, good morning to you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, so we saw the video there, a report from uh, Owen Sunday, our, our business correspondent. Some say these stakeholder consultations should have taken place before the PIA was passed. Others point to point out this is a statutory imperative and you can't make a perfect law. You've got to have amendments. Or what do you, what do you, what's your take on that? Yes, I certainly believe um, it's a combination of the two approaches. Um, continual stakeholder engagement is critical to the success of any process, especially for the PIA, which is an act that has you know, only recently been passed and hasn't really been applied or tested from an operational manner within the industry. Um, so whilst there are certain criticisms of the engagement process, it is indeed, like you mentioned, Rotus, a statutory requirement under the PIA. And to draw a parallel under the Electric um, Power Reforms Act of 2005 for the elect um, electricity sector, there is certainly provisions for engagement towards the development of regulations that are based off engagement of the stakeholders within the industry. And, you know, these engagements occur even today, almost 20 years since the act was passed. And um, really, it's important to also note that acts and constitutions are living documents and continue to be supplemented by regulations, amendments, and so on. Thank you for that. Um, NUPRC Chief Executive Benga Komalafe, he has, there's a quote from his prepared uh, comments here where he said there's a compelling need to conclude the regulation making process for implementation of the PIA to be in full throttle, so full speed, in a manner that Nigeria can hedge against the impact of energy transition and take advantage of the oil and gas supply gap resulting from the Russia-Ukraine uh, war. Um, have we missed the boat or what, what do you make of his comments? Is there still enough time to do that? Thanks, Rotis. I think to the first point in relation to taking advantage of the oil gas supply gap, I think of obviously the near term benefits lie in the rise in commodity prices that we're seeing as a fallout of, of the conflict, which is evident and has been beneficial to operators and players in the sector today. Um, in a longer term scenario where we have a protracted war, the longer term impact that we expect to see would be a shift in the global energy landscape, especially, of course, around the sources of natural gas, given Russia's involvement in the conflict. And here, we certainly see an opportunity for large-scale gas projects to fill that gap. And Africa, of course, remains uh, a source for that um, demand gap to be met. And it's also important to note that, you know, on you know, to caveat this conversation, that large-scale gas projects such as these have a long lead time you know, there are considerations to be had around in identifying interested sponsors, securing financing, of course, achieving investment decision on these projects and essentially crossing all the hurdles to execute the project. So case in point, of course, is the 12, um, 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 you know, is the Moz Mozambique LNG project, which has gone through quite a tumultuous um, process thus far. It initially achieved FID subsequently stepped down last year, has regained interest again from its sponsors. And, um, you know, in summary, I, I believe that the crisis would certainly give us, a, you know, um, should give us room to pause and um, should encourage the industry as a whole to see how we can position ourselves as a stronger global player in the face of a changing landscape. All right. And to your... Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, and again, to your second point on the energy transition... I mean, climate change is here to stay and, you know, the industry really needs to be thinking about how, you know, the, the global the, has to consider the global perspective and how that overlaps with the Nigerian oil and gas industry as we know it today. And, you know, I look forward to more regulations and guidance surrounding the energy transition um, within Nigeria. I'm glad you, you raised that point because I wanted to, as far as the debate is concerned around energy transition and, you know, the uh, the African continent, the narrative is that Africa shouldn't be rushed or bullied into renewables while it's still so dependent on, on fossil fuels. Or oh, what do you make of that? I mean, I think this is a topic that can certainly be explored, you know, over, over days. But I think we'll just put out some clear facts, right? Africa contributes only about 3% of global emissions yet is the most vulnerable continent to the effects of climate change and food security. And um, for oil producing countries across sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria obviously 
being um, a, a leader, there is a strong reliance on fossil fuels as a major revenue source for the government and for effectively running the country. And for Africa to achieve the level of growth in infrastructure that it so direly needs, there needs to be a balance between investment in infrastructure and, of course, energy guzzling, um, you know, projects on one hand and also marrying that with the global emissions target on the other hand. Um, we must note here that solar and renewables based on existing technologies are insufficient to meet energy needs for a rapidly growing continent such as Africa. Thanks. So I want to get back on, on the PI. The, uh, I want to take a list of uh, the phase one, I guess, touch points or to-do list um, for the agreement. So you've got the um, Nigerian upstream fee and rent regulations, petroleum licensing round regulations, domestic gas uh, obligation regulations, uh, conversion, royalty regulations, host communities. Well, what do you think is going to be most contentious uh, on this list? And do you think that everything can be resolved amicably? <laughs> Uh, amicable would be would be would be would be great, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah, just running through the list, I think a general comment that um, that I have here is really that the initial set of regulations being put forward are centered around commercial issues such as um, royalties, fees, and rents. And I think that this is this is a positive step in terms of approaching the implementation of the PIE, as these have a direct impact on investment decisions um, for oil and gas um, um, players. Um, a particularly important one, of course, would be the host community regulations, as we saw, you know, representatives in Abuja, uh, you know, particularly concerned about this, as this has an imp immediate impact on ongoing operations and um, production within Nigeria. And of course, will help paint the picture going forward. Um, I think another key one also would relate to the license conversion um, from the now defunct the PPTA, um, Petroleum Profits Tax Act, to the PIA. And um, these regulations will certainly help to clear up any different you know, interpretations and will provide guidance as to the mechanism for license conversions. Thanks for that. Uh, the, I want to get your take on this. The IMF revised Nigeria's GDP growth upwards, I think about 3.7%, based on the trajectory of oil prices and growth of the non-oil sector. Of course, U.S. dollar reserves haven't grown due to oil theft impacting production, haven't met the quotas. Well, what's your take on the, what, what's been happening with oil theft? Can this issue be addressed aggressively in, in, in your view? No, absolutely. I know. I mean, it's the oil theft issue is one that has been, you know, um, you know, focused on and has been highlighted over decades within Nigeria. And we certainly need to be thinking about this from a different lens and considering other solutions that are potentially different from the way that it's been approached in the past. Um, you know, for example, applying, considering and applying technology in terms of, you know, sort of meeting the 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 issues right at the fields, for example, for, for, you know, the use of drone surveillance, data gathering and analytics and so on, you know, these can support the efforts to curb oil theft. And certainly an increase in indigenous participation and more importantly, operatorship within the Niger Delta. Um, and of course, in the areas that are most prone to theft is quite key, again, in addressing the challenges that are seen in the Niger Delta. And um, lastly, of course, governmental support in providing adequate security to the operators and so on is quite key in terms of dealing with the oil theft issues, particularly in the long term. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Tolu uh, Awinfa from the UK there, energy specialist. We appreciate you talking to us about the PIA and other oil and gas matters in Nigeria. Thank you so much.